Thank you guys for tuning in today and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, Sam Raza. And today I'll be talking to Professor of History and the Director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at the American University, Professor Peter Kuznick. Peter Kuznick also co-authored a book with Hollywood film director and producer Oliver Stone called The Untold History of the United States. We've done extensive interviews on The Untold History of the United States, so if you missed that, be sure to check the link in the description. Peter Kuznick, thank you so much for your time today. Glad to be with you, Zane. Last year, U.S.-China relations took a hit when Nancy Pelosi, while serving as a Speaker of the House of Representatives, visited Taiwan. Then tensions seemed to ease a little bit when President Biden and President Xi Jinping of China met in Bali and underscored that the both countries must work together to address transnational challenges such as climate change. The two leaders agreed to empower key senior officials to maintain communications and also deepen constructive efforts on issues facing humanity. Now relations have taken a strong hit as a balloon, which the Pentagon claims is a submarine device, entered the U.S and was shot down later. China claims it was just a meteorological device intended for research purposes and that the US is overreacting by shooting it down. How do you assess the situation and what significance does it have on US-China relations? The biggest consequence really is that Anthony Blinken, US Secretary of State, canceled his trip to China and he was supposed to meet with uh, Wang Yi, he was supposed to meet with other Chinese officials, including Xi Jinping. That would have been a very important positive step in trying to ease relationships between the two countries. The relations are terrible right now. The uh, And both sides see it in very, very different ways. Uh, the United States looks at China as an aggressive power that's trying to establish hegemony over much of the Pacific. China is already the biggest trading partner of almost every country in the region and many countries in other parts of the world. So the U.S. sees it as its principal security threat. And the U.S. has been doing everything it can to contain China. So the U.S. has declared a trade war against China. The U.S. has banned selling microchips to China, thinking that it could slow down Chinese weapons and other advanced technological developments. Uh, the United States has been increasing its military presence throughout the region. We established the Quad, which includes India. Uh, the, the United States, if we look at the situation overall from the Chinese perspective, the United States is being very aggressive. It's working closely with the new Yoon government in South Korea. Now that much of that seems to be in confrontation with North Korea, and possibly re partly a response to North Korea's heightened missile tests over the past year. But it's also directed toward China. Uh, so that's been a collaboration. Yun is extremely right wing, increasingly unpopular inside South Korea. But as he becomes more unpopular domestically, he becomes closer to the United States. So unlike previous Moon Jae-in administration, which reached out to North Korea in a friendly way, South Korea has been increasing its military operations with the United States and se seemingly more alarmingly toward China, China and North Korea. Then we've got the situation in Japan, where Kishida, the Japanese prime minister, also very unpopular, has been effectively is going to double Japan's military spending. So Article 9 in Japan's peace constitution, which is the bedrock of the Japan's international role post-World War II, denying the, the legitimacy of any offensive nuclear forces 
that already is a dead letter. Even though many, much of the Japanese public still wants to retain it, it's mostly window dressing because the reality is that Japan will then have the third biggest military in the world and it's working on interoperability with the United States military and saying it's going to come to United States support if something happens in Taiwan. So that's the second leg of this. The third leg, we can look at what just happened with the Philippines. So back in October, the United States announced it was giving $100 million to the Philippine military. Now, just this past week, the United States announced that it's going to have use of nine bases in the Philippines. They can't officially become American bases because that would go against the Philippine Constitution. But it is very real that the United States can be able to use those bases to cite to send U.S. troops there, that's very, very close to what? Taiwan. Okay, meanwhile, the United States continues its troop buildup in uh, Okinawa uh, and, and, and uh, tightens its relations with Taiwan. So you began by talking about Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan and the re Chinese response to that. Well, Kevin McCarthy also says he's gonna visit Taiwan. The Chinese are furious about that. So why would the United States deliberately inflame the situation with Taiwan again? Well, that's what's happening. In addition, if we look at some of these other things that are going on in terms of the United States and, and China, U.S. Air Force General Minihan, this just to, uh, the week before, a week, two weeks ago, less than two weeks now, said that the United States and China will likely be at war in 2025. What is this guy talking about? And he says, he talks about his, his comment about, let me give you his exact quote if I can find it, because he says there uh, about how wonderful it'll be. He says, uh, he says, lethality matters most. When you can kill your enemy, Every part of your life is better. Your food tastes better. Your marriage is stronger. This is exactly this insanity that we heard from General Jack the Ripper in Dr. Strangelove. Okay, so your sex life is going to be better if you can kill more Chinese in this war. But the United States is preparing to be able to do that. And so... Uh, the, the buildup in, in the region and the United, the, from the Chinese perspective, okay, what does the United States look at? China's nuclear policy was always lean and effective. The idea that 200 Chinese nuclear missiles would be sufficient as a deterrent against a, a United States attack. And at one point against a Russian attack, but they're now they're close friends again. Uh, but what? But then, according to the Pentagon, China doubled its nuclear capabilities, went from 200 to 400 missiles, new intercontinental ballistic missiles last year. The Pentagon is projecting that China will have a thousand nuclear weapons by uh, 2030, and 1,500 by 2035. So the U.S. official projection is that China is trying to build toward nuclear parity with Russia and the United States. What do they base this on? They base this on the fact that China now has 20 missile silos, but that China is in the process of building 300 more missile silos. The U.S. assumption is that China is going to put a missile in each one of those silos and probably three nuclear warheads on each missile. And that's how they get to this projection. We know that historically throughout the Cold War, the U.S. intelligence was inflating this idea of threat inflation. The U.S. was dramatically inflating the number of, of, of missiles, 
of weapons that the Soviets had, that the Chinese had. Uh, we know about the missile gap based on completely bogus intelligence. And that's probably what's happening again, but we don't know. There's not a lot of transparency. But what China sees is the U.S. increasingly tightening relations with China and encouraging other U.S. allies to do the same with Taiwan, tightening relations with Taiwan, increasingly going against its one China policy. Uh, you know, the idea, according to the agreements the U.S. has, is that we recognize there is only one China and that Beijing is the capital of this China. Uh, and we maintain this pose of strategic ambiguity as to what we're going to do if China goes to war with Taiwan or China tries to retake Taiwan, which it considers part of China. Uh, but Biden has said on several different occasions <clears throat> that the U.S. will militarily come to China's assistance if, uh, if war breaks out. So. Mm -hmm. So unlike in Ukraine, where the U.S. is not directly getting involved, it's a U.S. proxy war. In China, the U.S. is threatening that it will. And then Biden walks it back each time. But the signal is quite clear and alarming to the Chinese. So the Chinese see the West preparing for war. The Chinese see the West tightening this vice around China's neck building up all these military assets to contain China. And China says, well, we need to be in a position where we have to make it clear that even if the U.S. strikes China first, then, the, then China will have the ability to retaliate and enough, enough missiles to get past America's missile defense. Nobody believes, believes America's missile defense is really going to be effective against a first strike by China or Russia. But what they believe is that if the U.S. strikes first and knocks out most of those Russian or Chinese missiles, then then China will have enough of a, a, a sec, second force to retaliate, is what they're hoping. But they see the U.S. increasing its surveillance, the U.S. increasing its uh, technological military capabilities. Because, again, it's a world in which not only is China modernizing and expanding its, military, its nuclear arsenal, all nine nuclear powers are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. Russia went in first because when the U.S. abrogated the ABM Treaty in 2002, Russia says, well, all bets are off. And they began modernizing. And on March 1st, 2018, Putin announced that Russia now has five new nuclear weapons, all of which can circumvent U.S. missile defense. Well, the United States has been modernizing also, beginning in 2010, when the U.S. signed the New START Treaty. Obama promised we were going to modernize every aspect of our nuclear arsenal and our delivery systems. And so what has the United States been doing? Uh, exactly that. And they're in the process right now, spending two trillion dollars almost to do it. So um, the Minuteman ICBM is being replaced by the new Sentinel ICBM, far more capable. Uh, the Ohio class sub is being replaced by the Columbia class sub, much more capable. Uh, B B2s and B-52 bombers are being replaced by B-21 Raiders stealth bombers uh, under construction as well. Uh, the lots of money being poured into missile defense to improve that as well. So the United States is on this vast modernization program mm -hmm. and trying to catch up to Russia and perhaps China and hypersonics also. And so uh, China sees this and they see how hostile the United States is. And they see that Biden came to power office, not breaking with Trump's aggressive policy toward China, doubling down on it instead, reinforcing it. Biden was in there when Obama or Hillary Clinton for Obama in November 2011 announces that 
the United States is going to have this Asia pivot, and we're going to pivot toward China as the main enemy. In 2018, the U.S. new security strategy says that the main threat to American security is no longer international terrorism. It's Russia and China. And then Biden comes to office, surrounds himself with 18 top advisors from the Center for New American Security. These are the China hawks. And so what we're seeing now is a growing sentiment in the U.S. Get Ukraine over with. So we can focus on the real goal, and that's stopping, that's containing China, and which is what Biden wanted to do from the beginning. So I'm not sure that they want to abandon Ukraine so quickly. We'll talk about that. Uh, but so the the balloon that you began the questioning with is really there's so much spying that goes on. We've got these low flying satellites that gather intelligence on each other all the time. So what what is the point of this? It's a mystery. We don't know. Uh, but uh, domestically, Biden has got to act like a tough guy, right? Because even when he shot down this balloon, uh, the Republicans are already show, claiming he's so weak, he should have shot it down immediately. Donald Trump screaming, oh, we should have shot it down, just shows how inept, how weak Biden is. Biden knew he had to be a tough macho guy or else he'd be pummeled by the Republicans and by U.S. media. And so he gave the order on Wednesday to shoot it down. They shot it down on Saturday when it went over the water. Uh, but the Republicans are still saying this is evidence of how weak he is. That's what the dialogue is in the U.S., it's crazy. It's ridiculous. And the media is very, very complicit in all of this. Uh, did it give the Russian, did it give the Chinese any new intelligence? Maybe the tiniest bit of intelligence, but nobody took it very, very seriously as an intelligence threat or as a military threat. Why did the Chinese keep doing this? That's another question that I don't have the answer to, but it did sabotage these uh, very, very important high-level negotiations between Blinken and his Chinese counterparts and Xi Jinping. We know what happened two years ago, two years ago next month, when Blinken and Sullivan met with the Chinese top officials in Anchorage in Alaska, and it was a disaster. So there has not been real high-level talks between the U.S. and China. Biden and Xi Jinping did talk in Bali in November, and that was a first step. We need so much more dialogue, especially in this situation, uh, because the possibility of misunderstanding and now provocations of the U.S. sending McCarthy to Taiwan, and then the Chinese again, the PRC again, will increase their flights uh, and their surveillance and their buzzing of of uh, Taiwanese airspace, it's the, the dangers are, are quite quite substantial. Uh, the question begs, given all of what you've explained, uh, the aggressive posture of the United States um, in surrounding China in its own uh, backyard, that China might be doing this. But why did the U.S. simply not capture this balloon and present it to the international community to evaluate what it actually was? Um, because it seems like that the U.S. is perhaps justifying its expansion and the media is parroting all of this 24-7 without even providing a bit of context like uh, you are doing. Uh, no, there's no context in the media at all. I mean, that's part of the problem with the American media. Um, the, 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 it's being posed as another act of Chinese aggression just like China's actions in the South China Sea are construed as aggression, just as the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs is construed as genocide, just as the crackdown on political rights in Hong Kong is seen as Chinese repression. Uh, there, Xi Jinping is not quite viewed as negatively as Vladimir Putin is in the United States, but he's a close second. And, uh, and, and there's no understanding from the Chinese standpoint. 
I mean, China's economy was growing at unbelievable record pace, many, many times faster than the United States ever grew, that Britain ever grew, that Germany ever grew, that India, any country. And the United States saw the prognostication was that China would, before very long, surpass the U.S. in terms of economic strength. And the United States decided it had to slow that down. China sees that as a direct threat, that a U.S. effective declaration of war. And NATO, which I didn't mention before, has also been expanding. NATO has been saying in its recent statements that it has to be dealing with China as well. Why is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization dealing with China as an enemy or a threat? I mean, this is a sign of growing U.S. hegemony and militarization of the planet. Now, I don't like a lot of things China's doing. I'm not saying that China is innocent in all of this. I would love to see a less aggressive stance by China in the South China Sea. Uh, I would love to see a more open policy uh, toward the Uyghurs. There's, there hasn't been nearly as much discussion of that recently, which makes me think that maybe uh, that is easing a little bit. I don't like to see that kind of repression. I would like to see much more democracy inside China. You know, 300 million surveillance cameras. What are they so afraid of? Uh, but that's the reality in China. And I can't control what China does. But from the standpoint of the world and this ramping up of tensions globally, that I do have some say about, and that I'm condemning as the U.S. being the number one uh, initiator of, of this. Uh, but and, and China, uh, for understandable reasons, abandoning, you know, China still has a no first use policy when it comes to nuclear weapons. The U.S. and Russia should adopt the same. But it is developing a launch on warning. So, uh, po approach and uh, you know and it's just getting more dangerous as it's responding to what it sees as an existential threat being posed by the West. Germany recently approved the Leopard 2 battle tank considered one of the most agile tanks in Europe even the United States will be sending 31 advanced M1 Abraham tanks to Ukraine the UK will be sending the Challenger 2 tanks and the US also recently announced to send long range missiles, I think with a range of 150 kilometers to Ukraine. Uh, there's a lot of talk now in the German media about providing fighter jets and more long range missiles. As of now, the US and Germany have ruled out these fighter jets, but we saw the same rhetoric when it came to advanced tanks. It was initially ruled out pressure mounted and then at some point NATO sent uh, these battle tanks and the same is expected of the fighter jets. Do you think these tanks will enhance Ukraine's military capabilities and change the tide of war and finally bring it to an end? No, definitely not. I think it will enhance Ukraine's capabilities somewhat. I think that is true. They might be able to use the tanks to break through Russian lines. You know, we saw that before, 80 years ago. We saw the big tank battles between Germans and Russians at Kursk and other places uh, during, the, during World War II. The optics are not great, given what the history is there. Uh, but is it going to change the tide of the war? No. Uh, number one, the Ukrainians need to be trained. It looks like the first tanks are starting to arrive in Poland, just started to arrive maybe yesterday or today, the first tank got there. But it's going to take weeks, if not months of training. The uh, And the American Abrams tanks are not going to arrive for perhaps six months or a year. They have to be built first. So are they going to be relevant? Maybe if it's a long drawn out war, they will become relevant. Uh, clearly, the, uh, the Leopard tanks uh, have enhanced capabilities, heavily armored, 
probably better than what the Russians have. Uh, so they will improve Ukraine's capabilities. Will it make a decisive difference? No. We already see the tide turning again. All the reports from the battlefield are that Russia is making steady but slow advances, uh, that they're going to pretty soon have Bakhmut encircled and Bakhmut will fall. And they'll have, at that point, much of Luhansk and Donetsk. So most of the Donbass will be in Russia's hands. Uh, there, and then Zaporizhia and Kherson, you know, the Russians declared those four provinces as part of Russia, and they are intent upon taking them. We figured at the beginning of the war, beginning of the invasion, or what the Russians call their special military operation, Russia controlled on February 23rd of last year, Russia controlled about 6% of Ukrainian territory. Now they control about 20% of Ukrainian territory. They're dug in, they're making advances, they're sending at least a couple hundred thousand more troops into the battle. Many of them have been well trained uh, and their military capabilities far, far in excess of what the Ukrainians can match. What the Ukrainians have is willpower. They've shown tremendous courage and tenacity. They fought better than anybody expected that they could. I mean, they've been quite brave uh, and they have been armed with vast amounts of U.S. and NATO weapons. As you said, first, you know, initially Obama refused to give any lethal aid. It was Trump who began giving lethal aid. So initially we're not even giving howitzers, you know, and, and we say we're not going to do it. Well, then Trump starts to give more lethal aid after his ploy to blackmail Ukraine was exposed, uh, leading to the first impeachment effort here. Uh, but, but then once Biden gets in there, we start giving more. So we say we're not going to give patriots. Then we give patriots. We say we're not going to give high Mars. Then we give high Mars. We say we're not going to give tanks. And then we give tanks. So the point you're making about the F-16s and the attack M's, the Army Tactical Missile Systems, uh, with greatly enhanced capabilities, um, is is real. Yeah, the Podolyak and other Ukrainian leaders have been saying that this is the same process that they've gone through before, the same dance, and that eventually the United States is going to see that Ukrainians are suffering and we're going to give in. Now, what happened with the tanks, though, is a little is interesting, because the Poles, who are the real, uh, who are the most hawkish? You got the uh, Romanians, the Poles, the Brits, the Finns. These are the super hawks, really. Uh, maybe the Latvians. Uh, and the, the Poles said that they were going to send their leopard tanks even if Germany did not give a permission to do so. That's what forced Scholz's hand, really. Uh, so why can't they do the same thing with other weapon systems that NATO has provided? It's, you know, I think that Poland is really itching for an expanded fight against Russia. Uh, you know, it was Brzezinski who said that he was the first Pole to be able to stick it to the Russians in 400 years. Now there are more Poles who are trying to stick it to the Russians and get us involved in a bigger, uglier war. But on the other hand, there's pushback against that. You've got the president of Croatia. You've got Orban in Hungary. You've got other Hungarian officials. You've got the president of Bulgaria. Let me tell you what, what he said. Um, uh, Radev, the president of Bulgaria, said, uh, said, I cannot accept the position that the war in Ukraine is a war of values when the greatest value is peace and human life. 
Giving arms means putting out the fire with gasoline, agreeing that there'll be many more victims and accepting the position that the war must be waged until the complete collapse of one side, which inevitably and gradually pushes us towards a global conflict with the possibility of nuclear self-destruction. I continue to defend my position that Bulgaria should not send weapons to this conflict. President Bulgaria, the president of Croatia, says Ukraine's not going to get take back Crimea or, or other territory. End this stupid thing, you know, the crazy, this dangerous, dangerous war uh, as soon as possible. And, and there's a lot of growing sentiment. I see the public opinion of polls in many parts of Europe saying that instead of giving more weapons, we need to find a diplomatic solution sooner rather than later. And that sentiment is building around the world right now. You talked about uh, the peace sediment uh, growing around the world, unfortunately, uh, led by powerful nations like Germany. Uh, Annalea Baerbock, our foreign minister, recently said at a parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, and I'm quoting her here, we are fighting a war against Russia and not against each other. Also, we can see in the media that the debate is no longer whether rep sending weapons itself is questionable or we should be pursuing alternative policies, but the debate is about what sort of weapons to send, how fast to send them. This premise of debate is accepted. Um, you've always provided a counter narrative to the corpor corporate media. What do you think the discussion should be now about that advocates for a peaceful solution that is sustainable and which both sides can accept at this stage? Unfortunately, I don't think there is a peaceful solution that both sides can accept. Um, I recently had lunch, a private lunch with the Russian ambassador to the United States. And, um, and I've been on many shows with Ukrainian officials and I hear the, what, what other Russian officials are saying. The Russians are convinced they're going to win this on the battlefield, that the West is going to lose interest, that the price is too high. And it's interesting because Rand just came out with a report last week uh, titled Avoiding a Long War, saying it's not in the United States interest to prolong this war, that we should go for a, figure out a settlement more quickly. And partly because they want to focus on China said this is limiting our ability to wage our proxy war against China or our uh, cold war against China. Um, so Baerbock, yeah, I means Baerbock is a super hawk. Uh, if Scholz had any balls, he would have thrown, kicked her out and gotten rid of her from the beginning. But this coalition government, you know, is he's a little limited, but the Greens are really hawks. Uh, really very, very hawkish. And Scholz is weak. Uh, um, you know, we've seen that, a lot of evidence of that. Uh, but the Ukrainians, are, are, their official line is still that they're going to claw back every inch of territory that the Russians have taken. Nobody believes they can do that. Uh, General Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, says Ukraine can't throw the Russians out militarily like that. So they're going to end on at the negotiating table. Let's get there sooner, is what Milley says. Um, that's basically what the Rand report is saying. That's what Biden even said at one point, that, that it's going to end at the negotiating table. Uh, so why are they carrying this out? Because there are some people who think Russia should be punished. And they want to say, they say that aggression should never be rewarded. You know, the United States didn't hold itself to that standard in Kuwait or in Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya. I mean, the, United, the world didn't punish the United States, but now this is an opportunity to punish Russia and weaken Russia. I don't like military aggression. I don't like the U.S. wars and I don't certainly don't like Russia's war. <clears throat> I can understand why they did it, but I... Um, certainly don't support Russia's actions. I would love to see this end without more killing. 
uh, because the the death tolls are not co nothing compared to America's wars. Right in Vietnam, Robert McNamara told my students that he accepts that 3.8 million Vietnamese were killed. There's only been a couple hundred thousand killed in this war so far. Fortunately, maybe not quite that many, but a lot of a lot of injury also. Uh, but there are positive signs. Maybe we should end on that. Pope Francis has offered the Vatican as a venue for no preconditions negotiations. Lula, uh, the Brazilian president, Lula, fortunately back in power, got rid of Bolsonaro. Lula has said in 2008, the G20 came together to deal with the world global crisis. He said, we need a new peace G20 uh, that will deal with the Ukrainian situation, have uh, sit down with Russia and Ukraine and figure out how to settle this now. And he said, China's got to be involved. India's got to be involved. Indonesia's got to be involved. He's talked to Macron and to Scholz about it. That's what we need is some statesmanship, some diplomacy. And China and India have to be involved. Turkey should be involved. Israel should be involved, at least Naftali Bennett, what he was saying. He said he got a promise from Putin not to kill Zelensky. And, and that, that Zelensky said, no, no, not joining NATO. That was back in February, right after the war started. And then that whole thing, then Boris Johnson, the clown, goes over there. And, you know, that then says, don't negotiate. We're, you know, fight, drag this out. We're going to arm you to the teeth. And he's still there waving the flag and, and calling for great expanded warfare. So it's, um, you know, and, and the New York Times had a very important article on January 18th saying that Amer Biden's advisors, top American officials are increasingly giving the green light to Ukraine to go after Crimea. They don't, they're don't. not convinced that they can take it, but they are convinced that it'll send a message to the Russians that, uh, that they better negotiate. And they're giving them the weapon systems to make that possible. Uh, it's insanity because they also, they all are also saying that not only does, do they not respect Russia's red lines, Russia doesn't have any red lines. It's insanity. They say, well, we, you know, initially we thought that if we sent in uh, Patriots or HIMARS or Abrams tanks and Leopard tanks, that would cross Russia's red lines. But Russia has not responded. So we can give them F-16s. We can give them attack -ems. And there's, Russia doesn't have any red lines. That's craziness. Because how do you know that deterrence has failed? You know it once it ends because the other, the, and there's the potentially mushroom clouds and uh, a full full scale World War Three. That's the you know John Kennedy said it best at uh, at American University in his 1963 commencement address. He said, nuclear powers must divert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. That's right. Do we have a collective death wish for the world? Do we, are we convinced that that kind of threat to Russia's interest is not going to trigger the use of tactical nuclear weapons? And how do we respond? How does the West respond with its own tactical? I mean, how do we escalate? The, the bull of the atomic scientists earlier this month moved the hands of the doomsday clock from 100 seconds before midnight to 90 seconds. That's crazy. It's, that means that they think that since this war started, the chances of nuclear our annihilation have only increased by 10%. I think they've increased by 30 or 40%. It shouldn't be 90 seconds. It should be closer to a minute, 60 seconds, if they really were analyzing what's going on and how much more dangerous the world has become. If we resolve this, if we start talking, and one of the other consequences is that 
there's there's the we've abandoned the bilateral strategic stability dialogue. We've abandoned any talk about arms control. Uh, we're accusing the Russians of have abrogating the New START treaty. And now we're saying that there's not going to no, both sides are, are hinting that given the, what's happening now, there's not going to be any more nuclear negotiations, which means we're going to be back to a 1980s style nuclear arms race. Now we've got, what, 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world. We used to have 70,000 and we could get back to that. And that's the madness of this situation. So Lula's right. The Pope is right. Uh, anybody who's advocating for negotiations, diplomacy, figuring out, uh, you know, do, do I want to see Ukraine give up territory? No. Do I think that that Ukraine giving up territory is better than World War Three? Yes. Uh, and and I think the people in those regions should have a say. And it's not the first time we've done it. Look what happened with uh, Kosovo. You know, this this has happened before, and it's happened to Sudan. It's happened in other places with Timor, um, you know, so Indonesia. So these things have happened, and it's, I don't like to see Russia be rewarded for this aggression, but I think we have to look realistically what's happening, how dangerous it is the effect is having on on global warming, the effect is having on global hunger, the effect that it's having on disrupting trade. Uh, you know, this is there are a lot of consequences beside the idea that Russia might have some mar some victory when the reality is Russia is is looking worse. Russia is losing. It's lost its prestige. Putin is as uh, an international pariah. Russian military has been degraded uh, and the Russian economy, while it's not as bad as Britain's economy. Uh, but you look at the effect. All this massive defense spending, there's strikes that are going on in Britain, in France, uh, elsewhere. All this, the, the, all these countries who are massively increasing their military spending. I'm sorry, I call it defense spending. It's got nothing to do with defense. It's military spending, uh, and it's supporting mm -hmm. the arms, munitions manufacturers, the merchants of death, and is the wrong way, way for the world to be going. So once we get out of this, we can back off some of that and back off all of this uh, military buildup, which is so dangerous, so foolhardy and so much the opposite of what the world needs. Peter Kostek, author and professor of history. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Zane. And thank you guys for tuning in today. Don't forget to join our alternative channels on Rumble and Telegram. YouTube is no longer recommending our videos to our own viewers like it used to a few years ago. So if you want our information to reach you, be sure to join us on these platforms. The links are in the description below. And also to donate. If you're gaining value and building your own perspective on these issues, then make sure to return that value by donating just a few dollars or euros a month via Patreon, PayPal or bank account. I'm your host, Zan Raza. See you guys next time.